Tonight on Talking Politics, young Americans have a bleak view of the state of democracy, according to a new poll with a seriously concerning number of young Republicans reporting they believe they could see a U.S. civil war in their lifetime. The chair of the Massachusetts Alliance of College Republicans and the president of the College Democrats of Massachusetts will join me on those findings and more ahead. But first, Suffolk County is in the market for a new district attorney after Rachel Rollins was finally confirmed as U.S. attorney for Massachusetts this week, following a hard-fought political battle. Rollins, who was the first black woman to be elected district attorney anywhere in the state, will now make history as the first black woman to serve as Massachusetts' top federal law enforcement official. Of course, Rollins made her mark as Suffolk DA with a focus on police accountability, rehabilitation rather than imprisonment, and reform efforts like her policy of not prosecuting several low-level nonviolent crimes. And while it's expected she'll aim to carry the same general sensibility into her next job, there are questions about how much leeway she'll have working with the Department of Justice. And then there's the question of who will replace her in Suffolk County. That decision lies with Governor Charlie Baker, who'll name an interim DA to serve for about a year until the next election. I'm joined now by the host of GBH's Under the Radar and Basic Black, Kelly Crossley, and GBH senior investigative reporter, Philip Martin. Good to see both of you. Good to see you. Kelly, you too, let me start with you. Mm -hmm. Most of President Biden's nominees have not elicited the level of opposition that Rachel Rollins did. Why was the GOP so intent on derailing her confirmation? Well, I think there's a couple of things. First of all, there are people who genuinely disagree with her philosophy. And she's a part of a group of, quote unquote, progressive district attorneys that were elected last go round in the country um, who share the view that low level crimes and nonviolent, we got to really emphasize that, should be looked at a little bit differently. And the emphasis should be elsewhere, that um, police are spinning their wheels and it doesn't uh, uh, impact the level of public safety that it ought to uh, by putting as much emphasis and time and resources into those crimes. And you get a whole different situation if you focus elsewhere. So that was her philosophy. That's what she ran on. That's what people supported her for. And that's just fundamentally not what a lot of Republicans agree with. So that's Let's start there. These are the, the three strike people after all. Uh, the second thing is, is I think they determined that of all the potential uh, picks that Biden could have, there are a few they were going to make examples of, and she was one. Um, for, you know, she came ready-made. She's very uh, public and vocal about how she stands. She felt very confident, as she should, about uh, the majority of weight that she brought with her into the job. She, she had an elected mandate. Uh, from the public. And um, she did not take any prisoners in expressing herself about, you know, what had happened uh, in, the, in the field of law enforcement that was to the detriment of many uh, specific communities, particularly low income and people of color, and that she was going to, to the best of her ability, maintaining the, the laws, uh, do what she could uh, to give us, uh, give our community uh, a different scenario. That is just not what so many people on the other side believe. And they thought, OK, we're going to pick her out. Now, I could also make a few other comments, too. She's also black and a woman. So that put her in a position um, for a lot of people to just come at uh, with uh, all torches blazing, if you will. So they wanted to make an example of her, and that was that. Philip, before I ask you if you agree with Kelly's take there, I want to make sure that people have a sense of the tenor of the GOP opposition to Rollins. Let's take a look at Senators Tom Cotton and Ted Cruz making the case against her confirmation. Ms. Rollins appears to measure success as a prosecutor not by how many victims and innocent people she protects, but rather about how many criminals she keeps from facing consequences. God help you if you don't want violent criminals robbing your store. God help you if you don't want drunken homeless people setting up tents in your front yard. Our communities don't need prosecutors who endanger the very communities they're supposed to serve by refusing to prosecute or detain criminals. I should cite here before you weigh in, Philip, that 
uh, Rollins has cited data showing mm -hmm. that when you choose not to prosecute these lower level nonviolent offenses, you actually get a better legal outcome, that people are less likely mm -hmm. to reenter the legal system. So I'm not sure that the senator's arguments hold up. But do you agree with Kelly about what was driving this opposition that was so fierce? I do. And if you listen to Cotton and uh, Cruz, the arguments they're making, this has to do with, um, uh, this has nothing to do with facts. Uh, much of the National Republican Party these days are fact-free, and this is yet another example. Uh, we know that crime has actually gone down in Boston overall. Homicides are up across the country, of course, uh, do many believe to the uh, pandemic, but this has nothing to do really with the, f the facts. This has to do, as Callie said, uh, with the uh, uh, opposition against quote-unquote progressive uh, district attorneys, uh, Rachel Rollins, the Larry Krasner model of Philadelphia, uh, pe people who basically have basically turned the notion of law and order, fire and brimstone type of politics on its head. Uh, so this is, uh, this is the score political points, and uh, Rachel Rollins happened to be the uh, perfect scapegoat, uh, as, um, as, as Callie uh, pointed out. Uh, n now, as far as uh, the broader um, op opposition, the, if you will, legitimate opposition, <clears throat> that have, that have, if you were going to argue philosophies, that's different. But if you were going to argue that this was about uh, her record, oh, that's problematic because her record has proven uh, fairly uh, successful. I'm going to ask you to talk a little more about her record in a moment. But first, Kelly, you mentioned how unfiltered Rollins has been throughout her tenure as Suffolk DA. She very famously sparred with the Baker administration when Tom Turco, then the Secretary of Public Safety, released a letter publicly mm -hmm. calling out her methods. She fired back with a press conference, a rally, uh, took on Turco and the governor as well. On our airwaves, on BPR, she called public defenders an overwhelmingly privileged group. That sparked a big outcry from people who thought of themselves as Rollins' allies, and she ended up backing off a bit. And then earlier this year, when there was talk of her leaving her post and Michael Flaherty, one of the people who's interested in replacing her current Boston City Councilor, maybe being tapped for the job by Charlie Baker, she sent this tweet, which I want to read in full. Sad world we live in when fools who can't spell my name correctly and don't know me speak and people listen. FYI, when DAs leave, at least all the men that did before I was elected, they recommend tell the governor who should replace them going back to real and serious things. Do you think she is going to be able to remain as unfiltered in her new role, or is she going to have to dial it back a bit? Well, I would describe her as frank and <laughs> candid, brutally candid. I'm unfiltered. I don't know if that's the word I would choose. But okay, sure. Never, sure. But, I, I like <laughs> frank and brutally candid. I, um, I, that resonates with me, too. Right. So um, here's what I, I want to emphasize. She is highly educated and highly credentialed. Now, you may disagree with her, and you can disagree with her affect, but she understands where she has to be in the roles that she has to play. So uh, my assumption is, and I know that's her understanding, or she wouldn't have put herself up for the job, is that when she takes over the federal role, it there's a different way that you present um, your take on things. Yep. It's just different. Um, and I expect her to be in line. So someone might ask, well, then why give up a position where she could be as brutally frank as she is for one that she may have to take on a different demeanor uh, in perhaps expressing how she feels about it? Because there's a lot of power in that role, the influence about who's at the table to make decisions about what cases she takes and what, what that says more broadly about issues at play is really important. Um, and so I think she'll bring all of that to the table, and you'll see her fitting in that role. I, I, nobody should know uh, better than she that if you step out of line, uh, period, but if you step out of line as a black woman and, uh, in, in, and not fitting in the role as, as it is prescribed, you know, you're out of there. That's not going to be appreciated, just, you know? Yeah, just just briefly, Adam, I, I would say I think the point about candid is something it's something we said about that. I was surprised, frankly, that uh, in the run up to uh, this week's vote uh, that uh, Rollins uh, appeared on so many different programs, including our own, to basically uh, enunciate, to articulate, to continue to uh, emphasize 
her progressive bona fides, uh, even as Tom Cotton and others were militating against her, uh, even to the point where I hosted um, an event several weeks, weeks ago with the New England Innocence Project and spoke with Rachel Rollins throughout the, uh, that, pro that program, where she again uh, talked about her belief in uh, not prosecuting low-level crimes, but the largely that's predicated on a belief uh, that the criminal justice system is systemically racist mm -hmm. uh, and that there has to be a way of basically mitigating that. Uh, and this is her approach to mitigating uh, the systemic inequalities that have existed in the criminal justice system and still do for, for, for many years. Philip, I want to ask you about what considerations Governor Baker might be weighing. He now gets to pick her replacement, who will serve temporarily before the next election. What are the factors you think he's weighing as he tries to figure out who to give this job to? I think I think there has to be some consideration, given the era we're in and the state we're in, uh, to race and gender. Uh, that's one consideration. But at the same time, we know that the governor is not a progressive. So he's going to basically pick someone, I believe, uh, not necessarily selected by or suggested by Rachel Rollins, but who basically uh, adheres to the degree that uh, uh, the black and perhaps a female candidate that he chooses, and I believe he will choose one, uh, um, is somewhat conservative, is not progressive, does not fit that model. And I think the type of person he's looking at, and perhaps the person he's looking at, hmm. could very well be Linda Champion, who has been very vocal about wanting this position. Uh, she's very competent. Uh, she is, uh, uh, she's decidedly conservative, certainly more conservative than every other, uh, uh, except for Greg Henning, every other DA candidate uh, who ran in 2018. Yeah. Uh, Greg, Greg Henning, of course, being the, uh, the person who came in second uh, behind uh, Rollins during the primary of 2018. But at the same time, Linda Champion came in dead last. She received only 9% of the vote uh, that, that year. Of, of the five candidates who ran in the Democratic primary, she received uh, 9%. Mm -hmm. Whether or not that's a consideration, we'll see. But I think he is looking for someone of that ilk. Uh, can one can more, I just add, oh, can sure, I add ahead, something Kevin. to it? Yeah. Um, the man is not running a game. He can do whatever yep. he wants. Now, one would hope, as Philip has just said, that he is paying attention to the tenor of the times um, and responding to that. But I'm just saying, he, there's no consequences for him. He can do whatever he wants. I want to say that. One other thing I want to mention, uh, Adam, two people got, two of President Biden's picks for U.S. attorneys got approved no problem. Gary Restino, federal prosecutor in Arizona, and also this other guy in Rhode Island, Philip Selinger, um, U.S. Senate approved both of them, no debate, no, down to 50 votes, 51, mm -hmm. break, just wanted to make, the, and if, if people want to pay attention to, guess who those two were? On <laughs> All right, noted. Just saying. Um, okay. I, I want to ask you, Philip, one more question about Wilkerson, and then turn to Diane, pardon me. I want to ask you, Philip, one more question about Rollins, and then turn to the possible comeback of former state senator Diane Wilkerson. Just briefly, Philip, expectations were very high for Rollins in her role as Suffolk DA. Were people satisfied with the amount of reform she was able to enact, or were people frustrated that she didn't go further? I think, by and large, people were and are satisfied. I, I, if you look at, again, groups like the New England Innocence Project, uh, they felt that, uh, in terms of her basically uh, working to free those individuals, uh, which evidence had always been problematic and become increasingly problematic over the years, uh, she has helped free, uh, I think uh, the number is uh, three individuals uh, who were incarcerated uh, unjustly. Uh, and as far as the broader sense of uh, uh, equity, uh, many believe that she also has uh, refrained from, again, prosecuting low-level yeah. offenses. But, but that doesn't mean she hasn't prosecuted offenses that are uh, low-level across the board. No, no, I was um, looking at, at some she, of the press she, releases uh, she sent out over the course of her tenure, and there's a, a whole lot of prosecutions there. Okay, that, thank you for that right. assessment mm -hmm. that she mostly got where people wanted her to go. Let's turn right. briefly to 
Diane Wilkerson. She told Gin Dumpsius of the Dorchester Reporter that she is thinking about running for the state Senate seat that she used to hold before she pleaded guilty to bribery and or accepting bribes and spent some time in prison. She told Gin, I haven't made a decision. That's my answer. Kelly Crossley, are you surprised that Diane Wilkerson is thinking about a return to electoral politics? Actually, no. Um, since I recall people talking to her when she first came back from um, having served her time, and you know, the question was, are you going to sort of be quiet and not do anything? And her answer uh, was akin to, I'm going to do the work that I think is important, which, as we know, she's continued to do. Um, so I'm not surprised that she decided to run. The question or will, may run. She hasn't yet committed, run. but she's thinking yes, about or it. Or may run, to your point. You're right. Correct. Um, does she have the support to do that? And oh, by the way, lots of folks who've been in similar situations have chosen to do that. And some of them have been successful. So, you know, she has a strong foundation in this community. I'll be interested to see what happens. Philip, last question to you. You did a great piece on Wilkerson's re-entry into public life earlier this year. She's been very vocal throughout the pandemic on issues involving equity, for example. So she's not coming out of nowhere here. But one of the points that you captured in that piece that I was really struck by is her seeming lack of contrition for the crimes she pleaded guilty to. You asked her if she regretted her actions, and she told you, I would say yes, but I don't know what I could have done. Like, I did not expect the federal informant, who she was caught on camera taking money from, to bring cash, and I couldn't walk down the street with it in my fist. She, of course, infamously was captured on camera stuffing cash into her brassiere. Is that lack of contrition going to be an electoral liability if she does run again? Well, if someone could afford to to basically make a commercial of that, it will be very much uh, a liability. But I would also, uh, in, in the very image, that very image is, um, is if you will, ingrained in many people's uh, uh, minds. But I would say this about Diane Wilkerson. She has a base of support. Whether that base of support can carry her through, it's not clear. But she has solid support uh, that I've been able to ascertain in Roxbury, certainly, parts of Jamaica Plain, of course, uh, the district she's running in would also include uh, the South End yep. and Hyde yep. Park uh, and Mission Hill. Uh, those are the areas uh, impacted. Uh, Hyde Park, she, she will do uh, terribly. Um, uh, it's not clear how well she will do in the South End, but she has many allies yeah. within, the, for example, the LGBTQ So community. it would not make her lot, candidacy a non-starter? It's not a non-starter at all. Uh, okay. A lot of people say Diane Wilkerson has served her time. And right. she's and, and they look at her work with the um, Black COVID Coalition, for example, and others, uh, or other organizations, and she's been steadily, she has. Uh, perhaps not thinking about running for uh, an office. I don't know if, because at the time I did ask her this question, and it wasn't something she's she thought been, about at all. Yeah, she's been coming mm -hmm. back. I'm sorry to, to interrupt. Yeah. We have to leave it not there to leave time for our next guest, but we could keep on going for a while on this. Mm -hmm. Philip Martin, Kelly Crossley, thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Next up, it is a bleak look at the state of democracy through the eyes of the nation's youngest voters. A Harvard Kennedy School Institute of Politics poll out this month finds only 7% of respondents, 18 to 25, view the U.S. as a healthy democracy, while 39% see it as a democracy in trouble and 13% call it a failure. Perhaps even more disturbing, more than a third of young people overall believe the likelihood of a second U.S. civil war is 50% or higher. And among young Republicans, nearly half hold that view. I am joined now by the president of the College Democrats of Massachusetts, Ted Park, and the chairman of the Massachusetts Alliance of College Republicans, Elijah Zay. Thank you both for being here. Elijah, let me start with you. There's a lot of pessimism contained in those numbers and some other findings from the poll. Do they square with your own worldview, or do they not quite capture the way you're thinking about the future of this country? They don't quite capture what I'm thinking about. Um, it kind of surprised me to see those numbers um, and how high they were among young Republicans. Um, as far as the point of our country being a democracy in peril, um, the thing that a lot of people don't understand is that we aren't a democracy. We're actually a constitutional republic. So instead of the people being the highest power in the land, the constitution is the highest power in the land. Um, and to the point of there being a possible civil war and people being worried about that, uh, as a country and as a populace, we've become so polarized 
And we've come to the point where people can share what they're thinking and how they feel on any topic at any given time over social media. And so seeing that day to day should worry some people. It is definitely worrisome. I wanna ask you a little more about polarization uh, in just a moment, but Ted, uh, what about you? Are you as pessimistic as those numbers suggest a lot of people are, or are you a little more optimistic like Elijah? Frankly, I'm not surprised at the, what the data is currently showing. Um, to be honest, young voters care about all the same issues that any other voter would care about. The difference is that young voters are not at the center of traditional politician strategies. Uh, so oftentimes when we look at uh, youth interactions with elections, one thing that comes up in discussions is the idea of feeling disconnected. Um, and a lot of polit political pundits kind of view this as apathy uh, from the younger generations. Uh, but feeling disconnected from a process that views that like the younger generations view as ineffective is not apathy, uh, especially when you consider how young people have been failed by political parties, including those who claim to represent us. I think that it absolutely makes sense that younger generations would have a more pessimistic view on the Constitution and democracy itself. All right, well, I'd love to get your thoughts and then maybe Elijah's thoughts. I, I think I might have heard a murmur of assent there. I'm not completely sure. Ted, what would you like to see uh, the Democratic Party that you're affiliated with, but more broadly speaking, the political establishment do to engage younger voters more and center you more in the political process than you have been? I think, as I just mentioned, one thing that both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party need to do is that to realize that there's no secret in engaging young first-time voters. I think that oftentimes, both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party try to specifically appeal to younger voters. And I think the one thing they need to emphasize and to truly recognize is that, as I mentioned before, young voters care about all the same issues that any yeah. voter would. As young voters will be eventually the future that will support all the generations before them, I think that oftentimes both Democrats and Republicans tend to tokenize younger voters and tend to kind of glorify and romanticize the younger generation. But it needs to be understood that in order to keep youth engagement and to prevent youth apathy in the political system, both parties need to incorporate them into the center of politics and especially the political establishment, such as members of the Senate or the House, need to recognize that younger voters should be in the sphere, in the center sphere of what American politics is all about. Got it. Elijah, do you agree with uh, Ted's diagnosis there? Yeah, no, he makes a lot of really good points. Um, you know, like he said, there is no secret to getting younger voters involved in politics and to make them uh, care more about what their uh, politicians are doing and who gets elected. I mean, from my own experience, I can just say that even mentioning something as, you know, hey, this campaign wants to hire younger uh, volunteers, sending that out to my people in my organization just gets them fired up. Um, there really isn't a secret. And I, I really think that there are a lot of young voters that do care, but at the same time, Ted makes a, another good point there when he said that um, the Democratic and Republican parties need to do a better job of engaging younger voters. Let me ask the two of you, one of the other findings from the poll, which I actually thought was somewhat, um, it made me optimistic, was that both among Democrats and Republicans, there's a desire, more people want to see the uh, elected officials meet in the middle and compromise, even if it means forsaking some of their priorities, than want to see people sticking to their guns, whether it means uh, you know they get nothing done or not. I want to just do a quick thought experiment. We've got like a minute and a half here. Let's say, Ted, that you were the uh, Senate leader right now in this deadlocked Senate, Elijah, that you were the Republican leader. Is there an issue, do you think, that you two might be able to find common ground on, even if it meant not playing to the base? And let's start with you, Ted, and go to Elijah. I think one thing that has really kind of driven the idea that American democracy is starting to crumble is the idea of the Supreme Court and justiciability. Uh, so when we discuss Congress, in prior years, uh, the political question doctrine used to be applied to determine justiciability in three key areas. So the ability to wage war, abortion, and gerrymandering. Um, so previously, and specifically to talk about war, Article 1, Section 8 states that Congress has the power to declare war, but the president also has commander-in-chief powers. Right. 
Uh, and this has come to hugely been a point of contention between the executive and legislative branch. If you look at the 1973 War Powers Resolution during the Nixon administration, we found that the president can start to just ignore Congress. Yep, and, and has repeatedly that, in the ensuing years, right? Yes, exactly. So are so you, think, we've only got about 45 seconds left. I apologize, huge questions, and I'm asking you to, to talk in sound bites. You're identifying the president's war powers, perhaps, as an area where you might make common ground? Yes. Okay, Elijah, what do you think? Is that, in my scenario, is that an area where there might be a Republican appetite for making common cause with Democrats to make change? Yes, of course. Um, one of the facets of the Republican Party is upholding the Constitution to the highest extent, uh, like I was talking about at the beginning of the segment. Um, and so if we were to hold the president accountable on those grounds, I think that is easily something that Democrats and Republicans can come together to agree upon. This conversation I greatly appreciate because it has left me much more optimistic about the future of the country than I was when I read the results of that poll. So Elijah, Zay, and Ted Park, thank you both, and we'd love to talk to you again in the future. Thanks, Thanks for having, having us. us. And thank you to all of you who have emailed, tweeted, and sent ideas through our website about what you'd like to see on this show in the future. We've heard a lot of very thoughtful feedback about guests, topics to dig into, and more. And we're aiming to incorporate as much of that as we can over the coming weeks and months. So please keep it coming. The email is talkingpolitics at wgbh.org. The website is gbhnews.org slash talkingpolitics. And you can always catch me on Twitter, where I find myself far too often, at Riley Adam. That is it for now. Thanks for watching, and good night.